On the seventh day of counting the ballots, the major news networks have finally called the Arizona governor's race for the Democrat. We all knew this was how it was going to turn out. We knew from the moment that they dragged the count on past election day, the longer the ballot counting takes, the more likely the races are to go to the Democrats. Coincidentally, what are the odds? So in a race that involved more than two and a half million votes, just about 20,000 ballots have determined that Arizona Secretary of State Katie Hobbs, who coincidentally was the official in charge of this very election, will be the next governor of Arizona over Kerry Lake, who had been campaigning specifically on rooting out corruption in the electoral process. The national GOP seems ready, happy even, to move on from Kerry Lake and from the whole MAGA movement. Carrie Lake remains defiant. Her, her response on Twitter was, Arizonans know BS when they see it. <laughs> Love her. Love her. In any case, Carrie Lake's apparent loss was supposed to be the final nail in the coffin of MAGA. And it may well be. But Donald Trump seems to be launching one last effort to keep his movement alive. And that announcement is scheduled to take place down at Mar-a-Lago, just some hours from now, I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment yesterday is from Old Schooled, who says, running a Biden-Fetterman ticket for 2024 would be a no-brainer. <laughs> waka waka. <laughs> that one got me that one, when, I, when I first read that comment. Good job, Old, old School has showed up before on the uh, best comment of the day. And that one, that was pretty good. And as our national policy is increasingly led by people who don't know what they're doing, who don't have the tightest grip on reality, you are going to want to make sure that your assets are in things that are really tangible, which is why you got to check out Birch Gold. Right now, text Knowles to 989898. Inflation continues to bedevil our economy. The Daily Wire reports that in less than two years, inflation has soared from 1.4% to 8.6%. As of May 2022, the price of gas was up nearly 49%. The price of meat, poultry, and fish was up 14.2%. And the price of used cars was up 16%. The current administration's irresponsible spending patterns, including Biden's $1.9 trillion rescue plan, continues to exacerbate the problem. Now is not the time to have all your money tied up in the stock market. Don't let your savings wither away. Hedge against inflation with gold from Birch Gold. Text Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, to 989898, and Birch Gold will send you a free info kit on protecting your savings with gold. Birch Gold is giving out a free gold bar with any purchase made by December 22nd, but you must submit your claim by Black Friday. With almost 20 years of experience in converting IRAs and 401ks into precious metals IRAs, Birch Gold can help you too. Don't sit around while the Fed devalues your hard-earned money. Text Knowles to 989898 and learn how you can convert at least part of your savings into a precious metals IRA. If you place an order by December 22nd, Birch Gold will send you a free gold bar. Text Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, to 989898. I have a lot of thoughts about this Arizona election. I have shared some of them. I have insinuated some of what I'm thinking about this election, but I'm not, you know, I'm, listen, I'm on YouTube. I'm not really officially allowed to say what I think about this election. So I'll let Marjorie Taylor Greene say it instead. I believe there was a lot of election fraud in the 2020 election. Absolutely, I do. I think that any time that we turn election day into election month, we, we create a big opening with mail-in ballots and absentee ballots. That's a giant opening for fraud. And I believe in safe elections, and I think that's something that every single voter wants to see happen. happen. And you're hearing it from people all over the country right now. It's, it is completely absurd that they are slowly counting ballots out in districts like in California, Arizona, and other states, we look like the laughing stock of the world. There's, foreign, there's other countries that do it in one day and count all of their ballots up and they get their elections done. I can't imagine why in the United States of America we can't accomplish this in one day. And I think it looks ridiculous. Preach it, lady. She's talking about 2020 and she's talking about 2022 and, and absolutely preach it. 
She's saying we're the laughing stock of the world. We can't conduct our own elections. And that's totally true. I remember Antonin Scalia made the same point after the 2000 presidential election, which by the way, did not hinge on how to count the ballots. It hinged on how and if to recount the ballots. We actually got the ballot count pretty quickly in 2000. What happened was Al Gore dragged out recount after recount after, well, what about the hanging chads? Well, after, well, the Florida Supreme Court said this, but who cares? Let's take it to the U.S. Supreme Court. And he just dragged the whole thing out. Talk about election denial or whatever they call it now. Scalia said, it's pathetic. We're supposed to be the world's greatest democracy. We can't even conduct our own elections. And now we can just never get the results on election night. Now we, we see articles that are, that are boosted on social media from all the mainstream platforms that say, here's why it actually takes weeks to count the ballots. Because uh, you're rigging it. That's, that's the only reason why. <laughs> you can't use COVID as an excuse anymore. Last time they said, well, because of this cough that has been going on for a couple of years now, you know, it, well, I guess in the 2000 election, just, just about one year now, there's been this cough from China. That's why we have to change all the election laws and get rid of all the election integrity protections. But that doesn't work anymore. COVID is over and they're just doing it because it gives the Democrats an unfair advantage. And very few people are willing to call that out. People say, where's the evidence? The rigging is the evidence. Where's the evidence? The fact that the libs have changed all the rules and gotten rid of so many of the protections that were put in place specifically to preserve election integrity, like election day, like all the poll watchers, like suppressing widespread mail-in ballots, like voter ID, like all of that. The fact that the libs are getting rid of all those protections is prima facie evidence of fraud. That's it. And very few, even Republicans, have the courage to call that out. And Marjorie Taylor Greene is one of the people who is doing it, which is why I like that lady. A lot of fancy people who wear fancy neckties and consider themselves part of the real sophisticate set, they don't want to be associated with Marjorie Taylor Greene because I guess she said some kooky things in the past and she's not very posh and clubbable. But Marjorie Taylor Greene is a much more serious person than Mitt Romney. Okay, Marjorie Taylor Greene is a much more serious person than so many of these stooges in the GOP establishment who do absolutely nothing other than turn a blind eye to Democrat corruption and allow the liberal ruling class to continue to wield and exercise power. Okay, and she's calling it like she sees it. And so is Carrie Lake. Carrie Lake is not just saying, oh, well, all right, on day seven of the voting count, I, I guess they got enough for Katie Hobbs. And that's that. Now I will go quietly into the night. No, she's saying this is BS. I'm going to fight this nonsense as, as best I can. Absolutely. I, but between those two choices, the really clubbable, nice touch of gray, fitted, beautiful suit Mitt Romney set of the GOP, who do nothing other than lose, and the fight them tooth and nail kind of set who are willing to call out collusion, real collusion between the Democrats and big tech and the bureaucracy and the news media and the, the ones who maybe aren't quite so sophisticated sounding, but they, they have their priorities in order. I, I'm with them. Okay. That's, that's my set. Now it's not all bad news. Uh, the Republicans, though we've lost the Senate, though we've lost some important governorships, NBC News even is projecting that the GOP is poised to retake control of the House. Now, it's going to be a really narrow margin. According to the NBC News projection, the uh, House of Representatives will be 219 Republicans, 216 Democrats. So all the Democrats will have to do is pry away a few Republicans, and then they can push through their agenda because then they'll have the Senate and then they have the White House so they can get done whatever they want to get done. That's not the kind of margin that you want to see. Now, if Republicans have control of the House, what's good is that the Speaker of the House, presumably Kevin McCarthy or some Republican leader, maybe McCarthy will face a challenge after this weak performance in the midterms, at least the Speaker of the House can refuse to take up certain bills. He will have certain procedural power to quash some Democrat uh, priorities. And one of those priorities that any Republican speaker should, should fight, one of those priorities that any Republicans in the Senate should fight is one of the most radical bills I have ever seen go through our Congress. It is a bill to radically redefine marriage. 
It is a bill to enshrine into law the Obergefell decision, which was a constitutionally preposterous decision to invent a new definition of marriage and shoehorn it into the Constitution somewhere. Uh, Chuck Schumer is now saying, according to CNN's congressional correspondent, that he has got 60 votes to ram this bill through. Don't forget, the Senate still has a filibuster, so Schumer doesn't just need a bare majority. Schumer needs 60 votes, which means he needs Republicans to vote to radically redefine marriage and to punish people for opposing this insane, absolutely incoherent definition of marriage that flies in the face of all of civilized tradition, every major religion, and human reason and the natural law. I'll, I'll put this into no uncertain terms because I, I know that... C- conservatives even, and, and certainly Republicans are kind of mixed on the issue of how to, how to define marriage. But when it comes to this bill, any Republican who votes for the radical redefinition of marriage bill should be expelled from the party. Any Republican. And I'm, I'm just laying this out there now so that the Republicans understand that there actually is still some opposition to this, that there are actually still some people who are willing to defend the actual definition of marriage that every single human being on earth, including Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, believed up until about five minutes ago, because it is just a a fact of reality and no amount of semantic gamesmanship or romantic poetry from the Supreme Court can change it. Any Republican who who supports this nonsense should be expelled from the party. And these Republicans are probably going to be thinking, well, look, if five of us or six of us, or 10 of us support this bill, they're not going to be able to primary all of us. There's not going to be the political will. There's not going to be enough money for it. Fair enough. So what I think we should make clear right now is the Republicans who support this bill, and there will be a few squishes, I think that conservatives who still understand what conservatism means and what marriage means, we should pick one of them. We should pick the weakest one of them, the one who we can most least expensively primary and kick out of office, and we should concert our effort to remove that Republican. Okay, so I don't know who that Republican's going to be. Is it going to be Mitt Romney? Is it going to be some other squish? Whoever it is, we should pick that person and make an example of that person, and we should turn all of our political firepower on that person to remove him from office, to send a message that we we will not stand idly by while the conservatives, quote unquote, squish on everything that matters, including the fundamental political institution, which is the family, which is marriage, just so that we can, I don't know what, maybe get some tax cuts sometimes for some gazillionaires in Silicon Valley who hate our guts anyway. I don't think so. We're not going to do that. All right. That would be the death of conservatism. We're all going to die someday. That's why you need a will. That's why you need to check out Epic Will. Right now, head on over to epicwill.com. Use promo code Knowles. If you are listening to this show, odds are that you care a lot about how your kids are raised. You understand that your children look to you to define their whole perception of reality, which is why it is extremely important that you have a will in place. This is probably the number one thing about making a will. You think a will is just about where your money goes, but That's not it. I remember when sweet little Lisa and I set up our will, we sat down and the biggest question is, who's going to raise our kids? Now there's other stuff that you got to, you got to think about too. Who's going to raise our kids? How does the money get set up? If God forbid something happens to us, when do the kids get the money? What about things like healthcare power of attorney to make sure that your wishes are carried out? You know, what about all of these questions that you have got to think about? Okay, well, Epic Will will make it super duper easy for you. Go to Epic Will dot com right now. Use promo code Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, to save 10% on Epic Will's complete will package. You can set it up. It does not take a whole lot of time. You save 10%. You can get an early estate plan starting at just 119 bucks and save that 10% right now. Epicwill.com, promo code Knowles. You know, there, on, on this marriage bill, you'll sometimes hear people say, some Republicans or some conservatives who are, or even liberals who are trying to catch us, they'll say, wait, I thought you were the party of small government. I thought, I thought Republicans were the party of small government. Now you want to define marriage? Okay, first of all, Republicans are not the party of small government. We are not in theory the party of small government, and we are not in practice the party of small government. The Republican Party was founded on big government. The Republican Party was founded to abolish slavery. (laughs) 
Okay. And the first Republican president was Abraham Lincoln. He was a big government conservative. He suspended habeas corpus. Okay. The guy was not small government. Now you might say, well, that's bad. Okay. I'm just telling you the history of the Republican party. We have had eight Republican presidents since Calvin Coolidge. Not one of them has shrunk the government. Not one of them. Not Eisenhower, not Nixon, not Jerry Ford, not the Bushes, not Reagan, not Trump, not, not one of them has shrunk the government. You might say, well, that's bad. Okay, I'm just telling you the history of the Republican Party. We are not the party of small government. We are not the party of reducing the size and scope of government. Sometimes we pretend that we are on television, but that's not actually what the Republican Party does. And I don't even support small government. I don't think there can be a small government in a country of 330 million people that governs a global empire. I like government within its just limits, but that's a different thing. What, what role does the government have in marriage? Well, I don't know. Marriage is the fundamental political institution. So if the state does not have some interest in the fundamental political institution, then the state doesn't have an interest in anything. And then we're all anarchists, which we're not. I'm not at least. I'm no anarchist. Okay. I think we need good rules. We're going to have rules. We're going to have a society. We're going to have laws. And so they should be good rules and not rule, rules that punish good stuff and promote bad stuff, but quite the opposite, which is what you're seeing play out right now with Pornhub. Pornhub is the largest, most mainstream porn company in the world. It's owned by a parent company called MindGeek. And MindGeek is now being sued into oblivion, and this is a really good thing. The parent company of Pornhub is being sued by a minor child's mother because this porn website allowed the dis- allegedly allowed the dissemination of videos and images of her little son being sexually molested by an Alabama man. This is despite warnings from the authorities to Pornhub. Pornhub still allowed this video to go out there. And so it's, I mean, it's so sick. It's so nauseating to think that this is out there, that it's legal. I think it's of kind of dubious legality that Pornhub is even allowed to exist, but it's tolerated at least by the law enforcement authorities, and that it's making a lot of money. That's awful. And so conservatives need to support this being shut down any way that we can. You'll, they were dealt a tough blow some months ago when credit card companies stopped doing business with MindGeek because of these kind of allegations of child pornography. And the more libertarian-minded conservatives, a lot of them said, no, it's absolutely, we need to defend Pornhub's right to spread filth around the world and addict little kids to pornography. Uh, But the conservatives said, okay, good, shut it down. Shut it down. (laughs) What percentage of my mailbag is young men writing into me saying they've got sex problems because they were exposed to porn when they were kids? A large percentage of it. When people come up to me at colleges and universities, that's often a, a, a problem that they will bring up. It's just it's just awful. It's awful, for, obviously, for the people being abused in the movies. It's awful for the people who are being addicted to the smut. It's awful for society that we're tolerating this at all. And for what? For the right of these perverts to exploit little children to make an extra buck? There's no right to that. You don't have a right to that at all. You Whatever to... There is a lot more wrong with Pornhub than the fact that there's child pornography on it. There's a lot more in addition to that that is wrong. But if the child porn thing is what's going to take them down, fine by me. Use whatever we can do. Speaking of dubious aspects of our popular culture, and apparently pornographers maybe, I don't know. I just One of my producers just told me that this girl has done some kind of porn and made a lot of money doing it. Remember Bad Baby? Bad Baby, spelled with two H's. Bad Baby, she is the girl who went on one of the daytime trash shows and said, cash me outside, how about that? Remember that? Cash me outside, how about that? And uh, she became kind of a meme and, and famous for this. So Bad Baby has just posted a new look. She was a kind of average looking white girl uh, with kind of colorful hair. And now she's posted after some kind of cosmetic or maybe surgical makeover with lots of tan product and things on. She looks kind of like a black woman. And she's dyed her hair jet black and her skin has been darkened and she's just presenting herself as a black woman. And so the reason I bring this up is not because I follow 
Oh, she, her hair was jet black. I'm sorry. The, the, her new image is that it's platinum blonde in a very sort of dyed, out of a can way. And then her skin is extremely dark. And she just, she's got big, you know, obviously surgically modified lips. And uh, I, she seems to have had some, some surgeries. Anyway, she, she looks much more like a black woman than she previously did. I bring it up because it tells you everything you need to know about white privilege. If white privilege existed, black people would pretend to be white because that would give them a privilege. But that's not what's actually happening. What's actually happening is that white women are pretending to be black. Rachel Dolezal pretends to be black because it gives her social privilege. Uh, Jessica Krug, do you remember Jessica Krug? She was an NYU professor. She's a, just a regular old Jewish lady. She pretended for her career that she was not Jewish, but black. Jennifer Lynn Benton. Jennifer Lynn Benton is a regular old white lady from Indiana. And she pretended to be black. And she, she had roles in BLM and all sorts of left-wing activism. So you got Rachel Dolezal's what? Czech, German, and Swedish. Uh, Jessica Krug, Jewish. Jennifer Lynn Benton, I don't know. She's just some kind of generic combination of, of, of whiteness. All pretending to be black. Even Sachin Littlefeather. Do you remember that Sachin Littlefeather was allegedly the Native American who Marlon Brando sent up to receive his Oscar for him and give a protest of the awful treatment of Native Americans? Just came out, she's not Native American at all. She's just a Mexican lady. Her name's Marie Cruz. She has no connection whatsoever to the Apache Indians. Because there is no privilege in our present culture associated with whiteness. Actually, there's only disadvantage. It's harder to get into college. It's harder to get a job. It's the, you're the only race that, you're, that it is not only permitted but encouraged uh, to, to insult in our culture. We're, we are told that white people are the only race that you can't be racist against. So yeah, of course, I'm not surprised at all that bad baby wants to look like a black lady. Okay. It just shows you how different the popular perception of reality can be from the reality itself. Another great example of this, Alex Jones. Alex Jones, <laughs> this is a story I meant to get to it at the end of last week. Alex Jones was just ordered to pay another half billion dollars to the families of the uh, kids who were killed in Sandy Hook Elementary School. So Alex Jones had already been ordered to pay almost a billion dollars. Then there was another uh, lawsuit that demanded that he pay $2.75 trillion. That's the GDP of many countries. And then he, in fact, it was the GDP of the United States not all that long ago. And now they're, they're ordering him to pay another half billion. It, it's going to be 10 gazillion dollars by the time that they're through. Not, uh, I'm not, I'm not defending Alex Jones. Okay. Alex Jones, he might be the worst guy in the world. I don't know. I don't know Alex Jones, but what he did, the thing that they're making him pay all that money for essentially was get a story wrong on the air. Alex Jones didn't kill anybody. Alex Jones, he just said things on the air that weren't true. The New York Times has gotten a lot of stories wrong. New York Times got stories wrong that helped lead to the Iraq war. New York Times has gotten stories wrong that led to the Russia collusion hoax. Plenty of people have gotten lots of stories wrong. The way that the establishment media reported on the George Floyd story led to, led to months and months of riots and arson and looting and dozens of deaths. None of them are ever going to have to pay one penny because they've got the power. And what we're told in this, in, in, in our silly, absurd culture, is that people like Alex Jones, they've got all the power. And we go after him. We're speaking truth to power. We're taking stuff away from the man. Alex Jones has no power at all. He's just an eccentric guy who sometimes takes his shirt off on air with a microphone in Texas. And they're going to take that microphone away from him if they can. It, the, the perception of power in the United States and the way that our political system works is very different from the reality. Very, very. In America, you basically can never be held to account for libel or defamation. It's very, very difficult. The libs will never be held to account for any of that. Alex Jones will. <laughs> the, the, the right wing people 
certainly will. You think Alex Jones is bad in the way that he talks about school shootings in particular? Wait until you hear about how the Washington Post talks about school shootings, which we will get to in one second, only after I tell you about the absolute best meat around today, Good Ranchers. Right now, head on over to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Knowles. Due to a shrinking herd, beef prices are expected to rise another 15% in 2023. Today's prices are going to seem cheap in just a few months. Supply will continue to become more and more scarce. That is why I subscribe and I recommend you subscribe to Good Ranchers. As grocery store meat prices rise, Good Ranchers inflation proofs your grocery bill by locking in your price for the life of your subscription. How do they do this? I have no idea, but it is insane. And if that's not enough to convince you, you can take advantage of their Black Friday offer, which is going on right now. Get two 12-ounce Black Angus New York strip steaks and two pasture-raised chicken breasts free with any order when you use code Knowles. While you can't control gas prices or mortgage rates, you can avoid meat inflation with a subscription to Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com, use code Knowles at checkout for this special offer. That is GoodRanchers.com, code Knowles, for two Black Angus New York strip steaks and pasture-raised chicken breasts free with your order. Good Ranchers, American meat delivered. Alex Jones needs to pay trillions of dollars, gazillions of dollars, because of the irresponsible way that he talked about a school shooting. Okay, when are we going to apply that standard to the Washington Post? Here is, here is how the Washington Post reported on a shooting at UVA. They said that uh, the shooter at, at UVA was, had a troubled childhood, but later flourished. A troubled childhood, but then flourished. Christopher Darnell Jones Jr., 22 years old, is charged with killing three and injuring two others at the University of Virginia. 22-year-old killed three football players, critically injured one other, then the other one was in the hospital as well. And, and it's basically a puff piece on this guy. Oh, he, you know, he was a good kid. Oh, well, it was too bad. He, you know, he never, had, kids would pick on him when he was a kid. You know, he got bullied. He was insulted. Isn't that, he had a, he had a tough childhood, but then he flourished and then he murdered three people. Is an austere religious f- student at UVA. That's, that's how the Washington Post talks about murderers, and terror and Muslim terrorists and all sorts of things. That gets a complete pass. Alex Jones gets a story wrong in the air, trillions and trillions of dollars. It's, it's not, to quote Adrian Vermeule, the Harvard law professor, when we, when we see this absolute sort of double standard, it's not that it's hypocrisy, it's hierarchy. It's just, there's just one set of rules for the liberals. There's one set of rules for the conservatives. Speaking of troubled childhoods, Nick Cannon now has 11 children with six women and a 12th child on the way. And there was a column in the Daily Wire by uh, Joe Curl. And it said, Nick Cannon, I think it was by Joe. And it said, Nick Cannon is the worst role model ever. And I have to correct Joe a little bit here. I agree, Nick Cannon is a terrible role model. But he's not the worst role model ever. To Nick Cannon's credit, in our abortive culture, at least he lets his children live. I mean that sincerely. We live in a culture that, at least before the Dobbs decision, killed 850,000 babies a year. So Nick Cannon is being very irresponsible, and there's no way that he can be a proper father to all of these children, and these children are not all going to grow up in the home with Nick Cannon, and they're going to miss out on a lot of daddy time, and they're going to have a very skewed understanding of marriage and the relations between men and women. That's all true. That's really uh, unfortunate. At least he didn't kill him. Nick Cannon is more responsible than many, many parents out there today who drive to the Planned Parenthood and kill their kids. Many, many parents. You think in New York, especially when we're talking about black babies, more black babies are are aborted in New York than born. So you want to knock Nick Cannon, absolutely. 
yeah, the guy, he really needs to shape up. He needs to act like a man. He needs to stop uh, disrespecting the institution of marriage, and he needs to be a better father. Yeah, that's true. At least he didn't kill them. The Nick Cannon stuff, by the way, is becoming mainstream. I mean, it, you're, you're now seeing report after report, weird social media video after weird social media video about how marriages are giving way in a culture that has abandoned the meaning of marriage to polycules. Okay, so this is our polycule. This is everybody, okay? Um, we also have two kids, but we don't show them on TikTok. Okay, so me and Kyle have been together for eight years. Been poly the whole time, okay? Me and Kyle are in a triad with Kit. We have been together, the three of us, for three years. We have one child together, and she's five. Oh, we don't show the kids on TikTok, though. Okay, so me and Kyle, and me, Kyle, and Kit, we're, we're triad, okay? Now, me and Sam and Kit and Katie met around the same time. I started dating Sam and Kit started dating Katie around the same time. My dogs are going crazy. Okay, so I started dating Sam, Kit started dating Katie, and then um, just about a little over a month ago, um, we moved everyone in together. So everyone lives in the same house now. We all live together. It would be funny, except for the kids. The kids thing makes it not funny. Because it, this is how this poor kid is going to grow up. Multiple kids, I guess. Imagine that someday, even when the kid has grown up. Hey, how'd your parents meet? How'd you, how, much, how much time do you have? Well, Kit met Kitty, and, and then Kitty met Davey, and then Davey had a relationship with Philip, and then that's not the sort of thing you want to be telling your grandkids. That's not a dignified way to live. It's weirder than the Nick Cannon stuff, frankly. Nick Cannon is just pretending that he's some, you know, Old Testament wayward king who's got a harem of women, multiple wives, and they're all obviously aware of one another. It's not good, but it's got, it's a little bit more traditional than this nonsense. And by the way, society broadly condemns what Nick Cannon is doing, but the society is largely encouraging what these weirdos are doing because these weirdos are able to wrap their, their perversions and their base desires up in the rainbow flag. Nick Cannon can't do that. Nick Cannon in many ways seems just like an emblem of the patriarchy. <laughs> Whereas these people, when they say, yeah, I'm dating three people in my household and I've got a kid with one of them and then the other one's got a kid with this one and then we got three dudes over there in the corner. Oh, love is love. Love is love. Don't, don't yuck my yum. You know, come on, man. We're all, just be tolerant, just be understanding. And then in our insane culture, we've got to say, wow, you're right. I just hadn't thought about it that way. You're right. You're in a polycule, man. That's cool. And by the way, at, when we take away the meaning of marriage, what is to say that marriage won't soon come to define this? There's no limiting principle on it whatsoever. I've got, I've got the language here, by the way, from the marriage bill. The, langu the, the marriage bill will allegedly, protect all religious liberty and conscious protections under the Constitution or federal law. And it will confirm that nonprofit religious organizations will not be required to provide services, facilities, or goods for the solemnization or celebration of a marriage. Okay, now notice that right here, by the way. They say a nonprofit religious organization will not be required to get along with, with the new definition of marriage, with gay marriage. What about businesses? They're, they're throwing... Uh, poor Jack Phillips under the bus. They're throwing Masterpiece Cake Shop under the bus. They're saying private companies and private artists will have to participate in gay marriages, even if it violates their religious beliefs. Religious Christians and Jews and Muslims, you're going to have to participate in gay marriages now if you don't want us to take your business away from you. And then it says, guarantees that this bill may not be used to de deny or alter any benefit, right, or status to any person or entity, blah, 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 blah. Oh, and then, oh, here we go. It makes clear that the bill does not require or authorize the federal government to, to recognize polygamous marriages. Yet, yet why not? First of all, how pathetic is this? This is what conservatism means now. Hey, look, I'm, I'm totally fine with radically redefining the bedrock social institution. Uh, but polygamy is too far. That's where I draw the line, okay? I'm a, listen, I'm a conservative. 
I'm going to draw the line. Listen, I'm totally fine with normalizing all sorts of sexual deviancy, but I draw the line at pedophilia for kids under eight. Okay, well, listen, I'm a conservative. I draw the line at, at kids under seven. They've already done this with the sex surgery. It used to be no weird transgender surgery because that's disordered and we don't encourage people to mutilate themselves. Now, it's okay, but not until they turn 18. Okay, but not until they turn 16. Okay, but not until they turn 12. Now, the best law on this in the country is from Ron DeSantis in Florida, and it says you can't trans the kids until third grade. Up, up until third grade, so starting in fourth grade, that's when they can be indoctrinated into LGBT. And by the way, it's the best law in the country. This is the most conservative law we've got. And they've actually done, okay, but only once you turn nine. I th- my friend Vivek Ramaswamy dubbed it the wait till eight bill. <laughs> and that's where it's going. So n- there's no reason to believe that this marriage law will actually prohibit polygamy for very long, because why would it? The argument for the real meaning of marriage is that marriage is in its very nature the union of one man and one woman for the sake of the generation and education of children. That's just what it is. Ontologically, that's what it is. The argument for redefining marriage is love is love, man. And Anthony Kennedy is there on the Supreme Court. He's like, (coughs) we got a right to intimacy, (coughs) you know, man. And it's like, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, right? So if that's the argument for it, it's just love is love. And whoever likes each other, they can just say that they're married. How on earth could you possibly prohibit polygamy from that definition? That would violate the the very premise of the redefinition. So get get ready for a polycule near you. You know, last year we launched our daily news podcast, Morning Wire. In this short period of time, it's become one of the top news podcasts. New episodes are available every morning, seven days a week, and they cover stories other media outlets won't touch. So check out Morning Wire on Daily Wire Plus, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Speaking of mental illness, horrible, terrifying news coming out of Canada. And Canada is usually at the avant-garde here. America's top hat is usually just a few steps ahead of where we are headed. So you got to be prepared for this to to come to the United States. We got to fight it tooth and nail. Canada is now encouraging mentally ill people to kill themselves. Uh, Canada has just passed an assisted suicide right. The Canadian Supreme Court discovered some right to kill yourself. Of course, there is no right to kill yourself because there's no right to do wrong. And, and killing oneself is a, is a, a grave, grave sin and, and a violation of the law of self-preservation. And it's just absolutely no bueno. Uh, but one, one of the arguments against assisted suicide, even the softest arguments for it. Well, what if someone is in intense pain and they've got a fatal illness, terminal illness that they're certainly going to die from very soon? Don't you think it's all right to just kind of up the drugs and kill them? And I don't think that that's right at all. But that that argument works on a lot of people. Then one of the arguments against that is, well, it's a slippery slope. It's a very slippery slope. And pretty soon, it's not just going to be those terminally ill cancer patients on the brink of death in intense pain who are opting for doctor-assisted suicide. Pretty soon it's going to be people who are younger, who are a little healthier, who are depressed, who have mental illness, who are poor. And now you're seeing this play out right now in Canada. Are you afraid to die? Who isn't? Yeah, I mean, it, it, uh... Amir Farsoud has applied for medically assisted dying, known as MAID. He lives in constant agony due to a back injury, but has started the process for end of life because his rooming house is up for sale and he can't find anywhere else to live that he can afford. He barely survives on Ontario disability support payments, which are just over $1,200 a month. He doesn't want to die, but being homeless is not an option. I know in my present health condition I would survive it anyway. Farsud meets the criteria for MAID, physical suffering due to disability that cannot be relieved. His doctor, who knows Farsud's real reason for MAID is his fear of being homeless, signed off on the application in August. Farsud needs a second to do the same. There's a 90-day waiting period. He believes he could potentially access MAID in about a month. I don't wish to be dead, Um, even with the pain, even with the meds. 
um, I still want to be here. Only the most evil society would tolerate this and encourage this. I mean, this, this is as evil as it gets. We, we talk about the Nazis, you know, we invoke the Nazis in every single historical comparison that anyone makes because they don't have any historical frame of reference. Telling our most vulnerable people, killing off our most vulnerable people, that is, that is whatever you accuse the Nazis of, that is, that is it. That is it. We are the baddies if we do that. We are as bad as it can possibly get if we do this. We're already pretty bad. We kill 850,000 babies a year here in the United States. And then on top of that, we're going to kill our elderly, our poor elderly. If you've ever had an aging relative, you know that at, when it comes to later stages of life, people feel they're a burden on their families. People feel there's a big cost. They need to be taken care of a lot more. They get depressed. I'm sure if this were an option, many, many people out of a feeling of despair and guilt for uh, putting their family through some difficulty would take this. It's not as though if you legalize MAID, that's the new euphemism they're calling it. It's just assisted suicide, which, which is just suicide. <laughs> it's suicide, but, but it's even more evil because it's got the complicity of the public health establishment, complete violation of the Hippocratic Oath and of sort of basic tenets of, of good political communities. If you legalize this stuff, it's not that you're just going to get a few fringe cases of people who are really thinking rationally and who just really have made a calculated, serious decision to kill themselves. It's going to spread like wildfire. It's going to be every old granny who feels that she's just a burden to her family. She's going to do it. She's going to feel pressured to do it. Every mentally ill person in a fit of insanity is going to do it. Every poor person who doesn't want to live on the street but can't afford to to make ends meet, is going to do it. Every depressed person, teenagers, children are doing this right now in Europe, in the Netherlands, Belgium. It's going to, it's going to spread like wildfire. And it is so, it is the most evil thing I can think of, this sort of thing. And the fact that you heard that doctor signed off on it, the doctor knew that the man, uh, no doctor should sign off on this ever. If a doctor signs off on assisted suicide, he should have his license revoked. He's violated the Hippocratic Oath. But the, the doctor knows that this guy's just killing himself because he fears poverty and homelessness. And instead of saying, hey, I'm going to refer you to this agency that's going to find you a home. Instead of saying, hey, here's a check. I'm a doctor. I make a decent amount of money. Actually, with Canada's socialist health care, probably not. But at least someone's saying, hey, here, I, I don't have much, but here's what money I can give you. Hey, don't kill yourself. Here's money to pay rent. Instead of doing that like a decent human being would do, he says, okay, here you go. Kill yourself. No, you got you to wait 90 days. I'm sorry. But then, bye. See ya. Doctor, I don't want to die, but I feel I, I don't have options. Oh, okay, then die. Just go die. Go kill yourself. But we're the good guys, right? We're the good guys. We're not like those bad guys. You know, it's amazing. The moral preening you hear from us in the West. Oh, okay. At least we're not like Putin. Putin's a bad guy. We're the good guy. At least we're not like Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping, he's the bad guy. We are slaughtering babies and telling the, the poor people to kill themselves rather than giving them alms. It's as evil as can be. And it's the logical conclusion of individualism, by the way. This is the other thing. This is why we're not immune to it. This is why even the right kind of goes along with this sometimes. Because yes, the end of leftism is suicide. <laughs> we know that. We are, yes, we, ex we understand that that is what leftism is about. It's just destroying everything, burning it all to, to the ground. But it's, it's the end of individualism, true. There are a lot of people on the right who accept the uh, very liberal premises of individualism, the idea that I own my body, that I'm answerable only to me. I can do whatever. I have a natural individual right to do whatever the hell I want, especially with my own body. You don't. That's not conservative. That has no ba basis in the proper Western tradition. That is an outgrowth of liberalism, and it's not true. It's not true. You don't choose to be born into this world. You shouldn't choose to come out of this world. You are not accountable only to yourself. You have obligations to your family, to your community, and ultimately to your God. But we have a new moral standard here in the West, and this is being represented in our symbols. The USA has just redesigned its soccer logo. Uh, USA has a soccer team, apparently. 
<laughs> News to me. I can't say I follow it all that closely. But the USA has a soccer team. And the USA, now they're about to play some soccer match in the Middle East. And they've redesigned their logo. The logo is no longer red, white, and blue. The logo is the rainbow. It's the gay, the gay pride flag. And you can see this on their larger logo. It says, One Nation USA Gay Pride Flag. doesn't say One Nation Under God. <laughs> they, they've clearly ta- gotten rid of that, that reference. One Nation, but not with the, sim- the traditional symbol of our nation, which is the red, white, and blue. It's No, it's the rainbow flag. Because the rainbow flag is, in many ways, the new American flag. I promise you, the liberals in this country identify much more closely with the rainbow flag than they do with the American flag, with the stars and stripes. The rainbow flag is the symbol, not of the traditional American nation, but of the American empire. That's why we fly pride flags in Afghanistan. That's why we fly pride flags at the Vatican. That's why we do it as a statement of American empire. Also because the pride flag uh, connotes universal values. The American flag, the traditional American flag, is a flag of a nation. It says, this is what our nation is about. And we're going to be a shining city on a hill. We're going to be a beacon of freedom to the world. But this is for us. The pride flag is for everybody. The pride flag is just to conquer everybody and to say that that these new values that we have enshrined, uh, in this case of sexual uh, eccentricity, are there for everybody. And actually, you, you have to accept them. The reason they're doing this in the Middle East is because the Middle East has a different, much more traditional view of these sexual matters. And so the, the United States, through the soccer team, are saying, no, you, you will adopt our views. We're going to go in there. If you don't allow for the sexual revolution to flourish, we're going to go in there. We're, we're going to impose it on you. And we've done that many, many times because that's the flag of our empire. So who's going to lead this empire? That's the big question for tonight. Donald Trump has announced that he's got a big announcement, perhaps one of the most historic announcements in American history. That's going to be at Mar-a-Lago. I will be covering that tonight as well, so be sure to tune in. I'm very excited for it. There's some tough news for Trump, though. There's a new poll out of Club for Growth. It shows that Ron DeSantis is not only gaining on Trump, but he's actually up on Trump in four key states. This is a poll conducted November 11th through the 13th. This is after the midterm election. Shows that DeSantis is up. He's beating Trump in New Hampshire, Iowa, Georgia, and Florida. Now you might say, well, I don't know if I trust this poll, or I don't know, maybe the club prefers DeSantis to Trump, or I don't know, the polls always are, they're wrong about everything. If you're Donald Trump, you're going to be worried about this poll, because right now Trump is the top of the pack in the GOP. At least he has been for the past two years, but things can change very, very quickly in politics. And I suspect this speech tonight is about stopping that momentum for DeSantis, turning it all around. But we'll have to wait to see. We know that the only thing that we can expect from the Donald is the unexpected. Today, we will be discovering all sorts of new genders on TikTok. I usually interview people on on Tuesdays, but you know, listen, today today is all about Trump's announcement. We're going to be talking later on for that. So I figured we needed to mix it up a little bit, get some, open our minds on these questions of gender. The rest of the show continues now. You don't want to miss it. If you're not a member, click the link in the description and join us.